This is Tech Talk Today, episode 280. Welcome into Tech Talk today. My name is Chris. And I'm Angela. Hello, Angers. We have so much to get into today, but just the way things worked out, we're going to start with a big plate of I told you so. The media, just 10 weeks after running Facebook through the ringer, is turning their attention on Google. And it's a full on assault. And it even has reached the offices of the Treasury Secretary. On Monday, the Treasury Secretary of the United States joined a growing chorus of government officials concerned about Google and other tech monopolies. They're tossing around the tech monopoly. And this weekend, 60 Minutes on CBS rolled out their big attack piece on Google. You think Google's a monopoly? Oh, yes. Of course, Google's a monopoly. In fact, they're a monopoly in several markets. They're a monopoly in search. They're a monopoly in search advertising. They know who you are where you are, what you just bought, what you might want to buy. And so if I'm an advertiser and I say, I want 24-year-old women in Nashville, Tennessee, who drive trucks and drink bourbon, I can do that on Google. Are you getting the hints of Facebook? Yeah. 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 Uh, (laughs) And they got got the very egregious um, CEO of Yelp on there who really feels like Google has been decimating their businesses over the years. And he had a couple of really key quotes that were real stingers Uh about Google. Let's hear him. Well, uh, okay, he had one that he said, if you provide great content in one of these categories, it's lucrative to Google and seen potentially as threatening, they'll snuff you out. They'll make you disappear. They'll bury you. If you're on the second or third page as a business, you don't exist. Jeez. It's kind of true, too. And then he had these visuals. He's like, here's what happens when you search for sushi in San Francisco. And the, the you know, over a fourth of the page. Yes, ad, ad, ad. It's all Google page. stuff. Yeah, it's oh. like, no, well, you have ads on one spot, but then you have like Google Maps, uh-huh. the, the reviews, like the, the open hours, useful information. Yeah. But it's competitive information that Yelp would normally be the one surfacing. And at the same time, Google's getting sued over in the UK for clandestine tracking. 4.4 million UK iPhones. Uh, This is a collective action that's being led by a former witch director, uh, Richard Lloyd, over claims that Google bypassed the privacy setting on Apple's Safari browser on iPhones between August 2011 and February 2012 in order to divide people into categories for advertisers. And I've heard a few quotes and they say, we've got the proof. And so they're going after Google for a whole bunch of money. This is all building while CBS is doing their big uh, 60 Minutes moment. You have the Treasury Secretary saying we need to look into these monopolies. And then you have lawsuits going on about clandestine data tracking. It's not at the same hype level that the Facebook uh, Cambridge Analytica story was, but it is kind of beginning to grow. And at the same time, you had a leak of this selfish ledger which is this futuristic google video about how tracking every aspect of you could be made better if the system recognized where they weren't tracking you and then automatically sort of herded you in the direction to get tracking so for example user data has the capability to survive beyond the limits of our biological selves in much the same way as genetic code is released and propagated in nature by considering this data through a lamarckian lens the codified experiences within the ledger become an accumulation of behavioral knowledge throughout the life of an individual. By thinking of user data as multi-generational, it becomes possible for emerging users to benefit from the preceding generation's behaviors and decisions. As new users enter an ecosystem, they begin to create their own trail of data. By comparing this emergent ledger with the mass of historical user data, it becomes possible to make increasingly accurate predictions about decisions and future behaviors. In this video, and you can go look it up, it's called The Selfish Ledger. It's about eight minutes long. In the video, they demonstrate how the system analyzed Angela Fisher, and they go, oh, you know what? We don't have Angela Fisher's current weight in the Google system. So it analyzes a bunch of products that you might be inclined to try that would give it that metric and start surfacing them to you. Okay, so I'm buying like two cases of pop chips a month now. (laughs) (laughs) And so I'm pretty sure that they know that I am eating way too many of these. Now, they're not fried. 
Yeah. You know? And and the, uh, according to the back, I shouldn't feel guilty. Right? But I don't think they understand how much I'm eating. <laughs> that's, what, that's what I like about sun chips. I always feel like I'm helping the environment when I eat sun <laughs> chips. I don't know why. I just feel like it's somehow related to solar energy. I think they cook them that way. Also, just one more Google story before we go on. Tomorrow, as we record... Everything is changing if you're a YouTube Red subscriber. Actually, I should make this clear. Nothing's changing if you're a YouTube Red subscriber. But if you're not one yet, everything is changing. And you're going to be looking for YouTube Premium because YouTube Music is launching. And so Google is pigeonholing everybody into new services. Yep. So Premium will include the music. Or no. Yeah, I believe it does. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I'm not actually 100 percent positive, but my understanding is is that premium is the the most the higher play is twelve dollars a month. You get YouTube Red and you get YouTube Music. Um, okay, I tried yeah. to catch you before we went into this, but um, clandestine. Oh, clandestine is how I like to say. It. I know, I know, and <laughs> unfortunately, uh, that yeah, I took your cue. So for any of you that are listening and want to make that comment on YouTube, we got it. We know that we said it wrong. Clandestine. Twice. We both, we each said it wrong. I prefer, no, I prefer never, it. It's not a matter of saying Well, it, it does wrong. have an E, and as Abby calls it, it's a bossy E. I know. So it makes that I an I sound, not an E. And the value of this, it's negative. That's Abby. Yeah, you see, the thing is, is I like, though, I like calling it clandestine. That's my preferentials right there, so I prefer that. That's not that's not a mistake. That is a preference. Okay. So a this preference. is a JB preference. This is a, this is part of the JB style guy. Is what that is. <laughs> <laughs> Last.ting.com. Ting is smarter than unlimited. If you just use less, you pay less. The average Ting bill is $23 per phone per month. Here's how it works. It's $6 for your line, and then you pay for your minutes, your messages, and your megabytes. End of story. That's it. It's simple. That's why it's smarter than unlimited, because if you got Wi-Fi at home, Wi-Fi at work, I mean, heck, I got Wi-Fi coming out the wazoo these days. I don't necessarily need LTE everywhere I go. I look at LTE as like a secondary backup connectivity. Wi-Fi is my primary connectivity, and it makes sense. It's faster. I can download more stuff. So you just pay for what you use. And then Ting has nationwide coverage. So rest assured, they got you covered wherever you might be, coast to coast. I'm looking forward to that on my trip down to Tejas, and they got no contracts. You like that? Chaos. <laughs> <laughs> they got no contracts, no service agreements. It's risk free to try it. Just go to last.ting.com. Also, a control panel that you might say it goes for days because you can see your usage at a glance. You can take complete control. You can set usage alerts. You can turn individual services off, deactivate service, or activate a device. And they got CDMA and GSM networks. So you can pick whatever works better in your area. And that means you can bring a whole bunch of types of devices, a whole batch. Check their BYOD page. And they got some devices you can bring directly. If you want to go to last.ting.com, they take $25 off a device. Or if you bring one, they'll give you $25 in service credit. Last.ting.com. Well, I never saw this coming. No, just kidding. I totally saw this coming. Movie Pass update. If you recall, we originally covered it. It was an amazing, like, ten no, five ninety nine. I think a month. They had a promo price of six ninety nine, but it was normally like ten bucks a month. Yeah, for unlimited movies in the theaters with some restrictions, which you know we all figured would have some restrictions, and then they upped it to ten something, and yep. everybody was like, "What?" But now. Now what's happened? They may only have days left. They may not make it through the summer blockbuster season. The company lost $107 million in the last quarter, earning just $1 million from marketing deals and $47 million from subscriptions. Now, Helios, the company I believe that is the owner of MoviePass, has fallen to a decade low of a dollar after peaking $32 in October. Now, it's not too surprising, like AMC's... Um, one of the largest theater chains in the world. And uh, they had a quote from one of their individuals there. They said, what we objected about movie pass was their price point, which we believed would cause them to hemorrhage cash and have an unsustainable, unsustainable business model. That was their chief executive officer. And a bunch of others have been left puzzled about how movie pass, how are they going to make money? Because the actual math doesn't quite work out. See for $10 per month, the un unlimited deal was likely to prove only temporary, even just looking at it at, on its face. 
people knew that wasn't going to work. Here's how the movie pass math kind of worked. And it basically banked on some people just not using the service very much. So if you assume that 20% of members see about two movies every month at an average cost to movie pass of $22, then movie pass expected to lose about $12 a month per member. But then they were hoping that 80% of their members would see about 10 movies per year, which would then generate $1 per month of profit for each member. That's not a very high margin. They're marketing it to the hardcore enthusiasts, you know, so and like the early adopters, like the people that have been waiting for something like this to make, you know, to lower the bill of their seeing movies. And of course, you know, that's not how it's going to work. No. And MoviePass's CEO bragged for a long time. Well, that's only part of our story. So we'll bank on 80 percent of our subscribers not going that often. But then we'll also monetize the ones that do go using their data. And that's going to be the profitable side of MoviePass. Retailers and services that are adjacent to movie-going experiences like restaurants, Ubers, and maybe even babysitters would become advertisers on the MoviePass platform. Because MoviePass was going to be like a Facebook for movie-obsessed individuals. And then they would have this ripe data that they would sell to marketers for you know, the night out at the movies. Uh, or if you're going out to say a movie and at the same time you book the movie, a little ad came up, would you like to book a babysitter? Those kinds of things they thought were going to be the jackpot. But Mark Douglas, the CEO of the digital ad platform Steelhouse, says that companies would pay no more than a few thousand dollars for access to MoviePass's customer database and maybe as much as like $25,000 to show a trailer to its subscribers. But the issue is, he says, they just don't have significant scale at MoviePass. Hmm. I'm just worried that they're going to like just completely disenfranchise the current subscribers. You know, I think in order to stay positive, like, but you know, not in the red. They're going to have to raise rates. The, either raise rates or make it even more restrictive. And I think they're down to like, only allowing you to see like four movies a month or something like they're yeah. there. It's not unlimited anymore. Right. And you can see lots and lots of complaints about people claiming their subscription was immediately canceled due to the checker charging the wrong movie. So like there's restrictions on like going to see 3ds or IMAX versions of movies. And if that shows up on what is essentially a MasterCard transaction list, they immediately cancel your service because this whole thing's based around like this MasterCard that they're monitoring. That you get in the mail or something? Yeah, it just doesn't seem like this is going to scale. Yeah. You know, the movie theaters need to come together on just some sort of subscription service and you pay into that and it just it's, it's, a, it's a membership that works at all of the theaters and it's this MasterCard thing where they're reviewing your charges. You could go buy stuff from the concessions with the MoviePass card, mm -hmm. but they will cancel your account immediately. But that's just weird. Yeah. Well, and wouldn't they want that data? Like it's well, more data. So. That's you know? the whole thing is they're all about the data. And that's what makes them interesting to follow on this show is it's this, this whole idea is lose your ass on the subscription, but make it up on the data. And uh, this is a real world physical test of this theory here. Mm -hmm. But Netflix's DVD system is doing pretty good. Yeah. Did you know they still rented DVDs? DVD.com. I mean... I don't. I yeah. canceled that like yeah. five years ago or something. But they've got a healthy three million subscribers still generating a whopping 56 million in profit. That's wow. not bad, really. Yeah. And uh, Netflix says that they have 100,000 DVDs in their category, which is a big, big number compared to just 5,600 streaming titles. So 100,000 DVDs versus 5,600 streaming titles on Netflix. Well, That's a huge they restrict gap. their content. Well, they they have they like, have horrible licensing agreements with the yeah, right. movie theaters. Yeah. The, well, but why why is it that DVDs are so much easier to Because there's older um, rules in place around ah, rentals of VHS and DVDs of physical things. Oh, yeah. the precedents that Blockbuster probably set. <laughs> yeah, yeah, basically. Yeah. And now wow. when it comes to streaming it's a whole new ball of wax. Yeah. So. They do, the studios get to have all kinds of licensing restrictions. Yeah, I feel like Netflix is kind of like Costco, where you finally like you find something that you like and then it's gone. You yeah, know? Yeah. Like that's where the DVD version isn't like that. And right. you know, if you've got Handbrake and make uh, MKV, I'm just saying <laughs> uh, it, it fell off a truck. <laughs> <clears throat> so despite the apparent success of Netflix DVD division, it's not really going anywhere. Uh, it, it's actually kind of been spinning down their DVD business, which is celebrating its 20th year, which that means I may have been a Netflix customer for 20 years. That's kind of crazy. Yeah. Had 50 distribution centers in its peak, but now it's down to just 17 
facilities left. You can get the DVDs for just $5 a month, by the way. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There, there's something to that. Yes. And I would be curious to compare it to um, the, uh, what are they called? The Red Box? Red something? Yeah. What are they called? I don't know. Yeah, Red Box, I think. Is it Red Box? Yeah, yeah. We, the, the vending machine. Yeah. I've yeah. never used that before. I almost did on a road trip really? once when we didn't have any cell signal because we do have a DVD Blu-ray player thing in the RV and we're like, we could just buy or rent that and and put it in the play. Ah, nah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Work. Yeah. Hashtag first world problem. Uh, we'll just stream something off the local disc. So uh, you better get prepared for all of your nudie pictures to get leaked on the internet. Oh, no. IBM is warning of instant breaking of encryption by quantum computers like the ones they're building. Wait, wait. I don't have an IBM. So I'm good. No, 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 no. Oh, crap. No, no. The no. IBM quantum computers will be able to break encryption used everywhere. What? Yeah. They say that it'll be instantaneous as well. So <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, they say it could happen in more than just, maybe just no more than five years, somewhere around five, six years because of rapid advances in quantum computer technologies. This is a direct quote from somebody of IBM Research working on this stuff. He says, anyone that wants to make sure that their data is protected for longer than 10 years needs to move to alternate forms of encryption now. Now, a lady that was speaking there uh, from the Churchill Club in San Francisco at, on this panel said that uh, this is something that is happening fast because there's a couple of large companies that have recently had some big breakthroughs that they're making available to the public. Now, it's been known since the 1980s that quantum computers would be a great at factoring large numbers, which is the foundation of public key cryptography. Quantum physics, one of the most successful theories of modern science, describes the way our world works at the most fundamental level. Quantum computing has become one of the leading applications of quantum physics. Quantum computers have the potential to solve some of the world's most complex problems that are beyond the reach of even today's most powerful supercomputers. Quantum computers are not going to replace classical computers, but their radically different way of operating enables them to perform calculations that classical computing cannot. Let's see how they differ. Classical computers encode information in bits, and each bit can represent a zero or a one. These zeros and ones act as on-off switches that ultimately translate into compute functions. To perform a simple calculation, like solving a maze, a classical computer would test each possible route one at a time to find the correct one. Just as classical computers have bits, quantum computers have qubits. Qubits, however, make use of two key principles of quantum physics, superposition and entanglement. Superposition means that each qubit can represent a zero, a one, or both at the same time. And entanglement happens when two qubits in a superposition are correlated with one another. Meaning the state of one, whether it's a zero, a one, or both, depends on the state of another. Using these two principles, qubits can act as a much more sophisticated version of switches, helping quantum computers solve difficult problems that are virtually impossible using classical computers. And you can add more qubits to a system later on, expanding how fast it can get those answers. But what's different here is advances in some what they call novel mat materials in low temperature physics have led to many breakthroughs in how they can cool these sons of guns, which apparently that's one of the key things because if they warm up, it starts to influence these qubits. And now there is a type of encryption they say that isn't susceptible to cracking by a quantum computer. It's called lattice field encryption. So go take a look into that. Uh, but quantum commu computing machines are currently rare. They're very expensive. But I, the IBM Q is an attempt to build a commercial system, and they've allowed 80,000 developers to run different applications through a, like a cloud-based interface that you just upload things to. So it's coming, Ange. It's coming. And they well, say you have about five years to move your stuff to new encryption schemes that they can't crack. Okay, so Q marketing from AWS and yeah. Google and it's a big, Dropbox. This is, this and, is a huge market. Like, so are, are, are they like Dropbox? Are they scrambling? Are, like No. No? No. Um, Nobody's going to do anything until... If somebody says, oh, I'm not too worried because my nudies are on the internet. Yeah, I mean, you know, the thing is, that is, the thing is, is... Uh, like, stored there. Here's how it's going to go mean. down. I mean, realistically, the way it's going to go down is large corporations and governments will get access to this technology first. So they'll use it to get access to whatever they need. And then it'll come down to the universities and it'll start coming down to the consumer scale. And then and when it gets to, I bet, the university level, that's when... 
the media will go into overdrive. Everyone will start freaking out and you'll start seeing Dropbox is now safe from the quantum, you know, encryption flip flaw or whatever they're going to call it. Mm. And you'll start seeing this big push about it. Like you're seeing with GDPR right now. Yeah. And it's not like the gray, gray box where no, no. you have to plug it into. No, the- this, this is uh this is, it's actually going after the math. So the way quantum computing works is with traditional computing, it's ones and zeros. So you mm-hmm. try something, it fails. You try something else, it fails. You try something else, it fails. You try something else, it fails. That takes forever to crack the math. But with quantum computing, as you add these qubits, you can try multiple problems at once. So you can start to try four iterations at once and then all of a sudden 50 because it's it's, it's exponentially. Right. Okay. So it's you can you with one calculation, you could try 50 cracks, second calculation and another 50 where instead of with traditional computing, it's one to one, one to one. But I guess where my gap in knowledge is, um, is like with the gray box, you would hook the iPhone up to it, or how would you do it? The, like, well, we don't do you really point, know. Pinpoint it to. We don't a, know. See, the, the where an you, IP. I, well, the address? thing about the gray box is we don't really know if the gray box is actually cracking encryption. It's more likely exploiting a flaw in the operating system oh. and then getting access to the encrypted data because of the operating system having permission to view the data. Okay. But with this, with quantum computing, they're going after the fundamental math, the, the, the calculations behind the encryption that secure it, and they're solving those math questions, and they can, they can just open up the data because they can solve the questions to the math problems. So it's, so the, it's, a, it's a difference of finding a flaw in the OS versus finding a flaw in the math. Mm-hmm. And okay. <laughs> I don't know about five years. When IBM says these kinds of things, I always kind of look at it and go, is that just marketing? We'll see. We'll see. Now, shake it all off. Shake it all off because we have something super cool that we could all get into right now. It's our Kickstarter of the week, and we're going to Mars. Woo! This is by the Mars Society, which is a serious group of folks that have that unit out in the Utah desert, the MDC, they call it, which is like a fake Mars where people go do faux Mars experiments. Yeah, Mars Base used to talk to us yeah. about this. And it's a legitimate way to do like pre-Mars studies before we can go there. And that team, the Mars Society, has a novel idea. And they're doing it in the form of a Kickstarter with 10 days to go. They have 127 backers. They have a goal of $27,000. They've raised 22. And it's Mars VR virtual reality platform to support exploring Mars, and they've got a basic idea. The idea is you send a robot platoon to Mars, map an area, and allow people to explore it in virtual reality. Later on, we send people to map much larger areas and have people travel alongside the astronauts as virtual reality assistants and scouts. So the idea is you get basic telemetry information, you get some cameras down there, and the astronauts going about doing their, their whatever their task is which is probably pretty limited in their suit and with the conditions and all of that. But all around them are virtual assistants that are people back in NASA or wherever. They're in VR suits. or Maybe they're just in a pod on the surface so they can have high bandwidth connectivity. And they're looking at that rock. They're looking at that dent over there. They're looking at all the different stuff because they don't have the constraints of being in a spacesuit or even being out in the elements. It's a neat idea. Yeah, it is. So, but everybody would have to pay, like, would it be a, probably a subscription service? No. So to get to all the way to going to Mars, to get to there, that's, you know, that could be millions, maybe billions. So they're starting with phase one, which is the Mars VR program that focuses on their Mars desert research station in Utah. Phase one of the Mars VR program will focus on designing training simulations for use at the Mars Desert Research Station and will be able to provide direct assistance in the training of the crew members. We'll create a virtual reality environment based on the facilities of the MDRS and the real physical terrain around the area. Every moment at the MDRS is precious, just like being in space, and we want them to make the most of it all. So just like they use the Mars Desert Research Station to simulate living on Mars, they're going to use it to learn how to do this right Mm -hmm. in Utah. And here's the other thing that's super cool about this is they're going to open source the key elements of the platform so the general public can freely make use of the experience and also... Explore Mars. And as part of the Mars VR initiative, the Mars Society plans to build a high resolution simulation of the entire MDRS habitat, both inside and out, which would be pretty cool to be able to walk around that as just somebody who would love to see what that's like. And the Mars Society staff will scan a one square mile capture of the Mars like terrain around the MDRS that 
that backers will be able to explore as well if they go beyond their $25,000 goal. And right now they're at $22,000. It's a $27,000 Total, goal. yeah. Well, they, right now they say funds raised beyond the twenty five. Oh, they must just be a typo. If oh. funds, but if funds are raised beyond their core goal, they're sure. going to try to use that to, to go beyond the one mile initial. And so the, the final goal to go through all of this, to learn all of this, do the public outreach, get the open source bits out in the community to get them working better. The final objective is really to take all of this to Mars. Hopefully we can apply these techniques to actual missions that are used on the red planet. And we're looking for your support to, to back the project so we can build this amazing functional VR tool for our futures. We're asking for your help with this effort. Help us pioneer the exploration of Mars using virtual reality. Woo! I'm okay. going to be a virtual astronaut. Yeah. So they have several different pledge levels. And what might you get? Yeah. Well, it's not bad, actually. So, you know, like the cheapest one is $5. You get a digital donor certificate. Woo! But at ten dollars, uh, you get a digital poster um, of uh, the VR stuff. I, mean, I don't know; it's some cool thing. But mm-hmm. twenty five is kind of where I get interested because you get a patch. And look Ooh, at yeah. you can see the, if you go to the Kickstarter, you can see it. That's a cool looking patch. It is. I was just before the show, not even yep. related to this, telling Ange how much I like patches for yes. logos. <laughs> I want to do some patches. And then around thirty dollars, you get the Steam key to actually um, do the VR game on your own local system. Cool. Yeah, it is pretty cool. I want to know the one where I get to go to Utah and hang out at the... Right? Walk on the simulated Mars. Hey, Mars base. uh, (laughs) Let us know. Uh, Anyways, that's pretty neat. We'll have a link to that in the show notes, techtalk.today slash 280 if you want to throw in on that. I would love to walk around the MDRS. That sounds super cool. All right, Andrew, before we go, a little bit of business here for the Tech Talk Today program. This is the last episode of the season. Woo! There it is. Ten episodes. We did it again. I'm proud of us. Yeah. Proud of us. Don't know why. It just feels like we just made an arbitrary uh, a, a goal, and then we just re- we just reached it arbitrarily. But it still feels good. And we're going to take a season break for a bit because I'm going to be on the road to Texas, down to Texas Linux Fest. But when we get back, we've decided there will be a season three, and we're going to come back bigger than ever. And we'll tell you more details about that soon because we're still lining everything up. But we got some good ideas, and I think you guys will enjoy it. It's going to be a lot of cool content, things like that. I'll just leave it at that. So so look forward to stuff in the future. If you want to contribute ideas that we could maybe try to incorporate, you can do that by using the contact form, techtalk.today forward slash contact. Yeah, this is a great time to get your ideas in here to help us reformulate. We didn't officially ask for that. I don't think maybe we did. And some people did send some ideas in that uh, were incorporated into the show. So we'd like to get your feedback. It's a good time to think about these things. Hit that contact page and hit that subscribe page, techtalk.today slash subscribe. So that way you don't have to worry about when the show is coming back. When it comes back, you just get the new episode in your podcast feeder. But in the meantime, go get more Andrews. Where are you? I am at Andrews. And I am at Chris LAS. I'll also have the Rover Tracker with me on my way down to Texas. So if you want to meet up while I'm going down to Texas, go to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash Rover. You can kind of see where I'll be at and hit me up on Twitter. Maybe we can say hi. And if you're in the Texas area, if you're going to be at Texas Linux Fest, we have a dedicated Texas Jupiter Broadcasting Telegram group now, jupiterbroadcasting.com slash Texas. We'll be organizing and coordinating in that Telegram group, jupiterbroadcasting.com slash Texas. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you next season. 